Publicity Campaign, first published in London Evening News, 1953, collected in The Other Side of the Sky. For the first few decades after the Martians lowered New Jersey real estate values, referring to Orson Welles's famous War of the Worlds broadcast, benevolent aliens were few and far between, perhaps the most notable example being Klaatu in The Day the Earth Stood Still. Yet nowadays, largely thanks to E.T., friendly and even cuddly aliens are taken almost for granted. Where does the truth lie? Of course, hostile and malevolent aliens make for much more exciting stories than benevolent ones. Moreover, the things you wouldn't like to meet in the 1950s and 60s, as has often been pointed out, were reflections of the paranoia of that time, particularly in the United States. Now the Cold War has, hopefully, given way to the tepid truce, we may look at the skies with less apprehensions. For we have already met Darth Vader, and he is us. The concussion of the last atom bomb still seemed to linger as the lights came on again. For a long time, no one moved. Then the assistant producer said innocently, well, R.B., what do you think of it? R.B. heaved himself out of his seat while his acolytes waited to see which way the cat would jump. It was then that they noticed that R.B.'s cigar had gone out. Why, that hadn't happened even at the preview of GWTW. Boys, he said ecstatically, we've got something here. How much did you say it cost, Mike? Six and a half million, R.B. It was cheap at the price. Let me tell you, I'll eat every foot of it if the gross doesn't beat Quo Vadis. He wheeled as swiftly as could be expected for one of his bulk, upon a small man still crouched in a seat at the back of the projection room. Snap out of it, Joe. The Earth's saved. You've seen all these space films. How does this line up with the earlier ones? Joe came to with an obvious effort. Well, there's no comparison, he said. It's got all the suspense of the thing without that awful letdown at the end when you saw the monster was human. The only picture that comes within miles of it is War of the Worlds. Some of the effects in that were nearly as good as ours, but of course George Powell didn't have 3D, and that sure makes a difference. When the Golden Gate Bridge went down, I thought that pier was going to hit me. The bit I liked best, put in Tony Auerbach from publicity, was when the Empire State Building split right up the middle. You don't suppose the owners might sue us, though? Of course not. No one expects any building to stand up to, uh, what does Script call them, city busters. And after all, we wiped out the rest of New York as well. Well, that scene in the Holland Tunnel when the roof gave way. Whoa, next time I'll take the ferry. Yes, that was very well done, almost too well done. But what really got me was those creatures from space. The animation was perfect. How'd you do it, Mike? A trade secret, said the proud producer. Still, I'll let you in on it. A lot of that stuff is genuine. What? Oh, don't get me wrong. Uh, we haven't been on location to Sirius B, but they developed a micro camera over at Caltech, and we used that to film spiders in action. We cut in the best shots, and I think you'd have a job telling which was micro and which was the full-size studio stuff. And now you understand why I wanted the aliens to be insects and not octopuses, like the script said first. Well, there's a good publicity angle here, said Tony. One thing worries me, though, that scene where the monsters kidnap Gloria. Do you suppose the censor... I mean, the way we've done it, it, it almost looks... Ah, quit worrying. That's what people are supposed to think. Anyway, we make it clear in the next reel that they really want her for dissection, so that's all right. It'll be a riot, gloated R.B., a faraway gleam in his eyes if he was already hearing the avalanche of dollars pouring into the box office. Look, we'll put another million into publicity. Watch the sky. The Syrians are coming. And we'll make thousands of clockwork models. Can't you imagine them scuttling around on their hairy legs? The people love to be scared, and we'll scare them. And by the time we finish, no one will be able to look at the sky without getting the creeps. I'll leave it to you, boys. This picture is going to make history. He was right. Monsters from Space hit the public two months later. Within a week of the simultaneous London and New York premieres, there could have been... No one in the Western world who had not seen the posters screaming, Earth, beware, or had not shuddered at the photograph of the hairy horrors stalking along deserted Fifth Avenue on their thin, many-jointed legs. 
Blimps cleverly disguised as spaceships cruised across the skies to the vast confusion of pilots who encountered them, and clockwork models of the alien invaders were everywhere, scaring old ladies out of their wits. The publicity campaign was brilliant, and the picture would undoubtedly have run for months had it not been for a coincidence as disastrous as it was unforeseeable. While the number of people fainting at each performance was still news, the skies of Earth filled suddenly with long, lean shadows sliding swiftly through the clouds. Prince Zervashny was good-natured, but inclined to be impetuous, a well-known failing of his race. There was no reason to suppose that his present mission, that of making a peaceful contact with the planet Earth, would present any particular problems. The correct technique of approach had been thoroughly worked out over many thousands of years, as the Third Galactic Empire slowly expanded its frontiers, absorbing planet after planet, sun upon sun. There was seldom any trouble. Really intelligent races can always cooperate, once they have got over the initial shock of learning that they are not alone in the universe. It was true that humanity had emerged from its primitive warlike stage only within the last generation. This, however, did not worry Prince Zervashny's chief advisor, Sigiznin II, professor of astropolitics. It's a perfectly typical Class E culture, said the professor, technically advanced, morally rather backward. However, they are already used to the conception of space flight and will soon take us for granted. The normal precautions will be sufficient until we have won their confidence. Very well, said the prince. Tell the envoys to leave at once. It was unfortunate that the normal precautions did not allow for Tony Auerbach's publicity campaign, which had now reached new heights of interplanetary xenophobia. The ambassadors landed in New York Central Park on the very day that a prominent astronomer, unusually hard up and therefore amenable to influence, announced in a widely reported interview that any visitors from space probably would be unfriendly. The luckless ambassadors, heading for the United Nations building, had got as far south as 60th Street when they met the mob. The encounter was very one-sided, and the scientists at the Museum of Natural History were most annoyed that there was so little left for them to examine. Prince Zervashny tried once more, on the other side of the planet, but the news had got there first. This time the ambassadors were armed, and gave a good account of themselves before they were overwhelmed by sheer numbers. Even so, it was not until the rocket bombs started climbing up toward his fleet that the prince finally lost his temper and decided to take drastic action. It was all over in twenty minutes, and was really quite painless. Then the prince turned to his advisor and said, with considerable understatement, That appears to be that. And now, can you tell me exactly what went wrong? Sigisnin II knitted his dozen flexible fingers together in acute anguish. It was not only the spectacle of the neatly disinfected earth that distressed him, though to a scientist the destruction of such a beautiful specimen is always a major tragedy. At least equally upsetting was the demolition of his theories and, with them, his reputation. I just don't understand it, he lamented. Of course, races at this level of culture are often suspicious and nervous when contact is first made, but they'd never had visitors before, so there was no reason for them to be hostile. Hostile? They were demons. I think they were all insane. The prince turned to his captain, a tripedal creature who looked rather like a ball of wool balanced on three knitting needles. Is the fleet reassembled? Yes, sire. Then we will return to base at optimum speed. This planet depresses me. On the dead and silent earth, the posters still screamed their warnings from a thousand hoardings. 
the malevolent insectile shapes shone pouring from the skies, bore no resemblance at all to Prince Zervashny, who, apart from his four eyes, might have been mistaken for a panda with purple fur, and who, moreover, had come from Rigel, not Sirius. But, of course, it was now much too late to point this out. Love That Universe First published in Escapade, 1961 Collected in The Wind from the Sun Mr. President, National Administrator, Planetary Delegates It is both an honor and a grave responsibility to address you at this moment of crisis. I am aware... I can very well understand that many of you are shocked and dismayed by some of the rumors that you have heard. But I must beg you to forget your natural prejudices at a time when the very existence of the human race, of the earth itself, is at stake. Some time ago I came across a century-old phrase, thinking the unthinkable. This is exactly what we have to do now. We must face the facts without flinching. We must not let our emotions sway our logic. Indeed, we must do the precise opposite. We must let our logic sway our emotions. The situation is desperate, but it is not hopeless. Thanks to the astonishing discoveries my colleagues have made at the Antigean station... For well, the reports are indeed true. We can establish contact with the super-civilizations at the galactic core. At least we can let them know of our existence. And if we can do that, it should be possible for us to appeal to them for help. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we can do by our own efforts in the brief time available. It is only ten years since the search for trans-Plutonian planets revealed the presence of the Black Dwarf. Only ninety years from now, it will make its perihelion passage and swing around the sun as it heads once more into the depths of space, leaving a shattered solar system behind it. All our resources, all our much-vaunted control over the forces of nature cannot alter its orbit by a fraction of an inch. But ever since the first of the so-called beacon stars was discovered at the end of the 20th century, we have known that there were civilizations with access to energy sources incomparably greater than ours. Some of you will doubtless recall the incredulity of the astronomers and later of the whole human race, when the first examples of cosmic engineering were detected in the Magellanic clouds. Here were stellar structures obeying no natural laws. Even now, we do not know their purpose. But we know their awesome implications. We share a universe with creatures who can juggle with the very stars. If they choose to help, it would be child's play for them to deflect a body like the Black Dwarf, only a few thousand times the mass of Earth. Child's play, did I call it? Yes, that may be literally true. You will all, I am certain, remember the great debate that followed the discovery of the super-civilizations. Should we attempt to communicate with them? Or would it be best to remain inconspicuous? There was the possibility, of course, that they already knew everything about us, or might be annoyed by our presumption, or might react in any number of unpleasant ways. Though the benefits from such contacts could be enormous, the risks were terrifying. But now we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And until now, there was another fact that made the matter of no more than long-term philosophical interest. 
though we could, at great expense, build radio transmitters capable of sending signals to these creatures, the nearest super-civilization is 7,000 light-years away. Even if it bothered to reply, it would be 14,000 years before we could get an answer. In these circumstances, it seemed that our superiors could be neither a help to us nor a threat. But now all this has changed. We can send signals to the stars at a speed that cannot yet be measured, and that may well be infinite. And we know that they are using such techniques, for we have detected their impulses, though we cannot begin to interpret them. These impulses are not electromagnetic, of course. We do not know what they are. We do not even have a name for them. Or rather, we have too many names. Yes, gentlemen, there is something, after all, in the old wives' tale about telepathy, ESP, or whatever you care to call it. But it is no wonder that the study of such phenomena never made any progress here on Earth, where there is the continuous background roar of a billion minds to swamp all signals. Even the pitiably limited progress that was made before the space age seems a miracle, like discovering the laws of music in a boiler factory. It was not until we could get away from our planet's mental tumult that there was any hope of establishing a real science of parapsychology. And even then we had to move to the other side of the Earth's orbit, where the noise was not only diminished by 180 million miles of distance, but also shielded by the unimaginable bulk of the sun itself. Only there, on our artificial planet Antigeos, could we detect and measure the feeble radiations of mentality and uncover their laws of propagation. In many respects, those laws are still baffling. However, we have established the basic facts. As had long been suspected by the few who believed in these phenomena, they are triggered by emotional states, not by pure willpower or deliberate conscious thought. It is not surprising, therefore, that so many reports of paranormal events in the past were associated with moments of death or disaster. Fear is a powerful generator. On rare occasions, it can manifest itself above the surrounding noise. Once this fact was recognized, we began to make progress. We induced artificial emotional states, first in single individuals, then in groups. We were able to measure how the signals attenuated with distance. Now we have a reliable, quantitative theory that has been checked out as far as Saturn. We believe that our calculations can be extended even to the stars. If this is correct, we can produce a, a shout that will be heard instantly over the whole galaxy. And surely there will be someone who will respond. Now, there is only one way in which a signal of the required intensity can be produced. I said that fear was a powerful generator, but it is not powerful enough. Even if we could strike all humanity with a simultaneous moment of terror, the impulse could not be detected more than 2,000 light years away. We need at least four times this range and we can achieve it by using the only emotion that is more powerful than fear. However, we also need the cooperation of not fewer than a billion individuals at a moment of time that must be synchronized to the second. My colleagues have solved all the purely technical problems, which are really quite trivial, the simple electrostimulation devices required have been used in medical research since the early 20th century, 
and the necessary timing pulse can be sent out over the planetary communications networks. All the units needed can be mass-produced within a month, and instruction in their use requires only a few minutes. It is the psychological preparation for, let us call it, O-Day, that will take a little longer. And that, gentlemen, is your problem. Naturally, we scientists will give you all possible help. We realize that there will be protests, cries of outrage, refusals to cooperate. But when one looks at the matter logically, is the idea really so offensive? Many of us think that, on the contrary, it has a certain appropriateness, even a poetic justice. Mankind now faces its ultimate emergency. In such a moment of crisis, is it not right for us to call upon the instinct that has always ensured our survival in the past? A poet in an earlier, almost equally troubled age put it better than I can ever hope to do. We must love one another or die. 